Okay. Yeah, if you want to get started. Super. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me again. Some of you may have seen this uh, already, so apologies for the repetition, but um, just want to give you a quick overview of who we are, what we do, and um, then I'll, I'll leave you to your to your evenings. So my name's uh, David Ricks. I'm the consultant relationship manager for Medical Protection Society. Um, as you can hopefully see on my slide there, we are offering free student and F1 memberships uh, currently. Um, Hopefully you know who Medical Protection are, we're one of the medical defence organisations um, and I'll just talk you through who we are and, and what we do now. So um, yeah, Medical Defence Organisation, we have um, 300 to over 300,000 members around the world. We perfect, uh, protect healthcare professionals worldwide um, and provide assistance with any medical legal problems that might arise from your medical practice. There's a QR code on all of the screens, but I'll pause on one towards the end. So if you want to zap it and, and join, feel free to do that. What are the benefits of, of joining us? Well, first of all, um, yeah, as you can see on the slide, up to 25% off a wide range of medical textbooks. The uh, foundation year is free um, this year. Uh, and in addition to uh, that we also provide a wide range of online learning, webinars, podcasts and case books. Um, been doing a lot with our members, particularly over the last year due to COVID. So talking about things like appropriate use of telemedicine, where obviously that's gone through the roof in the last uh, 12 months because people haven't been able to um, get into hospitals and for the elective stuff that maybe they would have done before. So yeah, so we've been putting on a lot of things there, uh, as well as what you, all the things you would expect, the importance of case notes, dealing with difficult patients, and also resilience and burnout was a huge, a huge thing prior to COVID. And I can only imagine it's, uh, it's, it's an even, even greater demand now in terms of support. Um, we provide a medico legal advice line which is available 24 7 in an emergency we do have uh, it's, it's fully staffed in house we don't outsource that and you can request assistance with any claims complaints disciplinary proceedings gmc issues and much more of course working in the nhs the nhs picks up the financial liability um, for any clinical negligence claims that may arise from your um, from your work uh, but they they wouldn't provide any support if, if you were pulled up in front of the GMC, for example. So, um, yeah, it's not just um, it's important to have someone on your side, really, in your corner, should you should something else come up. Oops, sorry. Uh, yep. Yeah, so uh, it only takes 60 seconds to sign up. Um, so uh, also the student membership is free. We are running a prize draw uh, at the moment. So you'll automatically be entered for a weekly draw of £183 if you sign up. Um, it's full details on the website. Uh, but I, th I think that's kind of the average cost for a week of living, uh, uh, living as a student. So yep, yeah, that will be available to you. And yeah, I'll just pause on this page for a few seconds. So if you want to sign up, you can do that. If you're an existing member, please do log in and refresh your details. It's really important we're able to keep in touch with you as you progress through your career, moving from your student addresses and emails through to uh, you know your, your first post. So really important that we can keep up so you have continuous protection. Um, and already, already mentioned the QR codes there if you're not a member and would like to sign up. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be around for a couple of minutes after this talk, so you can put them in the chat. Uh, alternatively, you can email us at the address you can see on screen. And then, yeah, um, you can follow us on social media if, uh, if, if you're so inclined with Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, all of that. So I think that's everything from me yes thank you very much for your time hope you have a lovely uh, and informative evening and as i say any questions do feel free to let me know great thank you so much um so i'm going to introduce our speaker for today her name is Sharmali. Sharmali, you with us hello are you all right to share your screen yeah just sharing it now. OK. 
Can you see it all? Yeah, got it. Sorry. Okay. Hello there, everyone. So my name is Shamali. I am currently working as an A and E doctor, and I'll be doing a presentation today on uh, the acute abdomen. Yeah, on the acute abdomen. This is mainly for people who are medical students and also foundation doctors or going to be foundation doctors. So this is part of the Medicine, the Essentials series, um, Foundations of a Junior Doctor. And this is, as I said, the acute abdomen episode. So before we start, um, please, um, can we have feedback? You'd be able to have a certificate within a week. Um, you can do that by scanning the QR code or following the hyperlink below. Um, we will be recording this episode and we'll be putting on our YouTube channel just in case you, uh, you know, would like to look at it again. Um, but in order to get the certificate, you will need to give feedback. So just give you a moment to save that uh, hyperlink or scan the QR code. So again, hello, Shamali, that's my name, and acute abdomen. So the aims of uh, today's presentation is to be able to identify the acute abdomen, to understand its significance, and basically just to go through various differentials, the main investigations and management plan. So again, we understand that you know, you're either medical students or foundation doctors, so we're not expecting you to be professors, we're just expecting you to be safe in accordance with GMC guidelines and just doing best by the patient and just doing everything as best as you can um, for the acute abdomen. So we'll be defining the acute abdomen, um, looking at how to approach a history and examination, appropriate investigations, and differentials management and then at the end we'll go through some cases um, before we begin if it would be very grateful if you could just switch your microphones off however if you would like to um, if you'd like to ask any questions you can do um, via the chat hold on a second okay so we'll be just going through some of the cases, not every possible case, and we're going to look. We're going to be looking at the most common sort of um, the common cases we'll get. So the acute abdomen, what is it? So it's obviously abdominal pain. It's what we consider it's sudden onset, and it's severe. It's non-traumatic, and it has to be less than twenty-four hours. So typically, it's between twelve to twenty-four hours. So can it necrose? Can it swell? Can it burst? Is there a stone? Is there an infection? These are the things that we're looking at. So obviously we'll be looking at um, medical diagnoses as well. It's not always a case of surgical case uh, at surgical diagnoses. So um, I'm not going to go through read out the list, but you can have a look at potential sort of medical diagnoses as well. However, in an A and E setting or an acute abdominal setting. Um, a lot of the time it is um, surgical. So the acute abdomen, um, you can divide it into certain locations. You can have it as a quadrant and sometimes you can see it in nines. So the main thing here is anytime you look at a quadrant, sometimes it's, it's easy to forget what differentials you can get. The easiest way to remember this is when you're looking at a particular quadrant, just think from you know, just a practical point of view, what organ is on that side? And so therefore, what kind of symptoms will it elicit? And as a result, what is the most likely diagnosis? And you don't have to have the one diagnosis, you might have several diagnoses, that's fine. Um, but it's just to have a sort of a systematic approach to it. So identifying the unwell patient, this is critical for just general anything, not just an acute abdomen, just an unwell patient, what are we going to be looking for? So um, before you can take a proper formal history, if you're fearing that someone is acutely ab 
um, acutely unwell, um, just look at the foot of the bed and what do they look like? Do they appear unwell? Do they do they look well? Just has you know just generally just eyeball them. What do they look like? Following that, look at them, feel them, listen, auscultate. Then we have um, objectives and observations. So are they hypotensive? Are they pyrexic? Are they hemodynamically stable? So these things you can you can gather pretty quickly. And then just from the bedside, what are the main things you'd be um, ordering for this patient? And in terms of treatment, to be able to go through the ones that is most life-threatening in that situation, how would you go about it in the most appropriate manner? And then following that, once you've kind of sort of found out what the main things are and you're treating them, then you can, you know, fill in the blanks and find out appropriate history, et cetera. So history and examination. So I know various people have different ways of remembering it, but I know in med school, Socrates is one of those things that people tend to talk about. So Socrates, so you have sight, onset, character, radiation, associated symptoms, uh, the duration or the time, and exacerbating or relieving factors and severity. This can be seen as, you know, potential like a pain score. What is it out of 10? Um, other things that we're looking at is how they've been during the week. Um, fever, sweat, generally unwell. Um, remember to look at red flag symptoms, weight loss and dysphagia. Um, nausea and vomiting. So when you think of vomiting, what kind of vomiting is it? Is it just watery vomit? Is it bilious vomiting? Is it blood? Is it coffee ground? And then the various bowel habits you can talk about jaundice, um, dysuria, hematuria, also about gynecology, any, any issues with their menstrual cycle or anything out of the ordinary, you do have to ask about that. Is there a potential that they're pregnant or they don't know about it? You do have to ask these questions. Um, along with medical history, it's always very, very important to ask about sexual history. Very important, especially in the case of pelvic inflammatory, inflammatory diseases. So these are just um, some of the areas you're looking at and potential diagnoses. You can have a look at that image. And um, whilst I talk about it in the context of examination, we're looking at potential signs. So just some of the main things we tend to look at. So we have Murphy sign. This is typically in acute appendicitis. What is it? Asking the patient to take a deep breath in and hold it. Um, whilst you're doing it, you're palpating in the right subcostal region. If in that time it elic you consider it a Murphy's positive is when there's pain, and that's usually when your hand comes into contact with an inflamed gallbladder. So this is for acute appendicitis, um, sorry, um, cholecystitis. Then you have Rossing sign. So this could be in a query appendicitis. This is a palpation of the left lower quadrant and it increases the pain in the right lower quadrant. Typically, this is in sort of earlier onset of appendicitis um, because it's sort of like a diffuse pain. It's not, it's, it's not very well localized. However, over time, um, if, if it's a little bit more advanced, it might be very specific to the right iliac fossa. And that sort of takes us on to um, McBurney's point, McBurney's sign. Um, so the McBurney's point is over the right side of the abdomen. It's typically over the third of the distance from the anterior superior iliac spine and the umbilicus. So in this area, if it's tender, like deep tenderness, um, and it's positive, then you're thinking it, it's an appendicitis. Um, psoas sign. So again, this is what we look for in appendicitis. This is basically a right iliac fossa pain with extension of the right hip. So this is just a reminder that an appendicitis, it depends on the location of the appendix and that particular individual. So if we're thinking of um, a retrocecal position of the appendix, um, it's so as positive because you're eliciting um, 
sort of a reaction of the inflamed appendix in that area. So extension of the right hip. So Gray Turner's and Cullen's. So this is basically bruising in Gray, gray Turner's, it's over the flanks. And in Cullen, Cullen's, it's in the uh, peri umbilical area. They typically go in the sort of 24 to 48 hour range. I'm not gonna say it's a very common thing. You find it all the time. However, uh, these, these things are sort of like textbook things and good for exams um, and it, it might come up. So how I remember it is gray turners. So the idea of having turn and potentially turning the patient, so it's on their flank side. Um, and that's how I remember that. So any sort of bruising in that area, it's associated with acute uh, pancreatitis, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, or potentially a rupture of a AAA. So guarding, typically we uh, divide it into voluntary guarding and involuntary guarding. Involuntary is associated with rigidity and it's considered a very dangerous surgical situation. Um, however, involuntary guarding, which is usually the case in many patients, it just means they're in a, a lot of pain and they don't want you touching the area at all. Okay, so management. So one thing that we tend to talk about is A to E. So this again is not just with acute abdomen. This is just with anything. It's all in the, the, the reason why we have an A to E is in a case where, say, you have an acutely unwell patient, it's very, very easy to get bog, bogged down by loads of other things going on at the same time. But when you know it's just one of those systematic things, it's the easiest way not to leave anything out by accident. So after your A to E, if you're thinking it's acutely unwell surgical patient with an acute abdomen, um, kneel by mouth until the surgeon say otherwise. Good to have uh, two large bore cannulae for, you know, if, if they need blood, if they need fluids, if they need antiemetics, anything, IVs the way. Uh, manage symptoms, I cannot stress, stress this enough. Adequate analgesia anti, and antiemetics. A lot of the times a patient might be tachycardic, they might be they they might be hypertensive just because of pain management. They're in so much pain. So it's it's good to try and um try and get those new scores down and obviously for the patient as well so they feel better. BTE prophylaxis, appropriate investigations and escalation to the correct team. So it's fine to be stuck sometimes. You're not sure, you, you feel a little bit out of your depth. You can always talk to your seniors for, for, for some backup and following them, make the right decision. You don't really want to be sending a surgical patient to the medical team. So find out enough information to, you know, to appropriately refer a patient on. So other than that, some other considerations. So antibiotics, um, if you're thinking of an infection. So in terms of antibiotics, if you, if you think someone's septic or it's part of your sepsis screen to provide antibiotics, the main thing I kind of need to emphasize is in this case, it's better to know what the source is, um, like you know your, the, the, the suspected source, um, as opposed to just giving antibiotics willy-nilly, um, you know, look at your local guidelines, uh, micro guide, speak, speak to anyone about the antibiotics if you need in surgical team, you know, what would they think um, is best for this patient. Um, fluids, if they're hypotensive, um, any electrolyte imbalances. Um, I know during this time, you can kind of tell um, in, the, in the formal bloods, but an acutely unwell patient, a VBG, an ABG, these are very informative. You can look at the pH, are they acidotic? Their lactate, they, do they look like they're very dehydrated? Sodium, potassium, um, you know, the various other things, base excess, you know, bicarbonate, all these other things. But the basic sort of results you can have on a VBG, and you can, along with observations, and you can treat adequately um, at the start. Um, so, an NG tube, if you're thinking of a bowel obstruction, so these are potential things to look at. A urinary catheter. So, if you have someone, they look like they're septic. Um, say they've got dementia or, or they have incontinence. So you don't really know what they're producing. So you, in these patients, you really need to have an input-output chart. So in this case, a urinary catheter might be the way to go. 
So the types of investigations. So um, you obviously want to rule out the most dangerous things and just have your top few differentials. Like I said, no one's expecting you to be you know, a professor and all of this, a specialist. You just need to know the right things to do at the right time. This is crucial for a patient, especially in the you know, unstable, unwell patient. So bedside, it's always good to do an ECG. Look at their BMs. Um, other examinations, you might need to do a PV examination, a PR examination, urine dip. So in a case, for example, when a gentleman has come in with abdominal pain and he is in a lot of pain, not really sure what it is, um, it's always good to have a urine dip to show potentially if there's blood, there's hematuria, is there a possibility of stones? Um, in female patients, pregnancy tests. This is one of those things you just have to do. So whether it's in an OSCE situation, if it's in um, MCQ situation, whether it's in real life, always, always, always do a pregnancy test in all females between 15 to 50. I cannot stress this enough. Um, it's one of those um, rookie mistakes not to, you know, it's one of those rookie mistakes not to ask for a pregnancy test, especially if you're going to get a urine dip anyway. Far scan, you might need to do this on an uh, on a on an abdomen if you're you know querying potentially like a rupture or someone is in so much pain and you know you're trying to stabilize them and before they go to CT just to give us a little bit more information. So no one's expecting you to do this scan. You can just ask your senior to to help you with this. So, like I said, BBGs, looking at pH, lactate, electrolytes. So these things can be done instantly. So it's a very good way of seeing, are they acidotic? Yes or no. Are, are they, do they look stable? You're looking at, the, looking at the patient, looking at ob observations, VBG, it's somewhat enough at this stage to kind of make a basic plan for this patient. And then, of course, you've got your other tests that you can do. So imaging, these again, from an A&E point of view, or just even if you're on a ward, something that can be done um, quite quickly in, in a short space of time, a chest x-ray. Um, so if you look at, want to look at free air under the diaphragm for anema peritoneum, an abdominal x-ray, if you want to look at bowel obstruction or a sort of volvulus, anything like that can be done in abdominal x-ray. Um, ultrasound, so if we're thinking of a female patient um, of sort of um, childbearing age and you don't want to give them CT, ultrasound, and um, obviously younger children, if you don't want to um, give them a lot of radiation, you can go for the ultrasound. And obviously you have CT abdomen, uh, CT KUV, and then you have your scopes as well. So um, the, the lower down you go, this is more the sort of advanced stuff, but the, the basic stuff, just always start from basics. So interpreting investigation. So I've just got two examples here. Um, so just a quick recap. Obviously, this is not a radiology um, episode, but just so you have an idea of how to look at it, just uh, like x-rays for chest x-rays, make sure the projection you know what projection you're looking at, AP versus PA. Um, just know with AP, sometimes the heart borders might look a little bit bigger. Uh, the patient might be rotated a little. So these things you have to take into consideration. Um, make sure you're looking at the right patient <laughs> for patient details for the x-ray. Um, so technical adequacy, just look, are they, are they well rotated, good inspiration? And then are there any obvious abnormalities? So for example, on the left, if we have a look at it, you can see an obvious abnormality. So it's good to acknowledge your obvious abnormality, but then after that, go in a systematic way. So airway is a trachea centrally located. So for breathing, look at the AP, the AP is right here. Following that, just look at the hilum. Following that, look behind the heart. Following that, look at the costophrenic angles. So why I say this is aphids, sometimes someone comes in with chest pain and they might have a pneumothorax. Even a small pneumothorax can be painful. So it's always very, very good to look at the aphids right here. This is where they're typically missed. Um, and here you can obviously 
air under the diaphragm. So if you're looking at the diaphragm and the costophonic angles, you can you can see free air under the diaphragm. So in this case, we do have um, a pneumoperitoneum. Uh, okay. Now the one on the right hand side. So if we're going in the same sort of way, so trachea centrally located, breathing. So just having a look from the apis, as we're following all the way, you can see this um, lower lobe consolidation on the right. So sometimes someone may come in with right upper quadrant pain. Doesn't typically doesn't have to be chest pain. So we still need to think of medical causes of you know someone coming with abdominal pain. Um, so yeah. And following that, like I said, uh, look at the diaphragm, look at the bones, soft tissue, and then any lines. Um, review areas, so the main areas to review, apices, hyla, um, costophrenic angle, and behind the heart, the diaphragm. These are, I would say, are the main things we need to. So now we're looking at um, abdominal x-rays. So just make sure right patient, right scan, uh, from an A&E very busy situation, just make sure these basic things are all right. Um, again, any obvious abnormalities, um, make a note of them. And then following that, just review in a sort of systematic way. So the way I think about it, again, if we're going to go back to the images we, sh we saw before looking at quadrants and where things are, typically the small bowels are centrally located and the large bowels are peripherally located. So um, in this case, on the left, we can see a lot of these things are more centrally located and we have to look at thickness as well. So typically in large bowel abnormalities, um, there's usually bowel thickness of more than six centimetres and in small bowel is more than three centimetres. So if you can look at any packs, things, you can, you can get the ruler and you can measure it out if you need to. Um, small bowel um, obstruction is associated with um, valvular uh, conventors and in large bowels on the right here you can see it's more peripherally located and you can see the hostral folds so along with the measurements and along with the location it gives you a better understanding that's not to say you can't get a combination of peripherally and centrally sometimes you can get that you can have an obstruction that um, started off, say, in the sigmoid, and then it, it you get you get further obstruction. So it's not always the case, but sometimes it's just good to just have a look um, and then see if any obvious abnormalities, and then approach it in a systematic way. Okay, so we're going to look at cases. Sorry, give me a second. I'm just going to see if I can open the chat. Um, Hold on, Natalie, are you there? Sorry, give. Sorry guys, I'm just trying to get the chat open as well. Let me send a message on the chat and see if you can get it. Okay, thank you. So if you scroll to the top or to the bottom or exit your PowerPoint and if you open up Zoom. Hold on a second. Did I say stop share, yeah? Um, you don't have to, but if you're finding it difficult, you can do that.
Okay, so now I can see the chat. Have you got it? Should be on the bottom. And to get the chat and Hold on, give me a second. If it's easier and if people are feeling brave, they can also unmute themselves to answer things. Hello. So um, I can now see the chat. So would someone like to just type something and I'll see if it's working? Anybody? Okay, good. Okay, so we will go by the area of pain and we'll discuss the differentials and um, investigations and management. Um, the common things um, we'll be looking at as well, but we're also looking at whatever you think it could be at this point. So if you have any ideas, um, just go for it. So case one, you've got a female, she's in her 20s. She has nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, she has watery stools, and bowel sounds are present. Her observations seem fine. So, guys, if you could just say what investigations would you do in this patient? Good pregnancy test, X ray. A to E pregnancy test, stool sample, okay. Urine analysis, HCG, great guys. Yeah, okay, so I think, so I, I, I'll, I'll go by the majority. So I've seen uh, VBGs uh, or just blood gases, pregnancy tests, good, um, stool samples and I think someone mentioned x-ray, abdo x-ray. Okay, fine, good. Um, we'll talk about what we could do in an A&E situation um, uh, in a second. Um, what would your management be for this patient? First line management. Fluids, good. Anything else you can think of? So this patient is vomiting. Good, antiemetics, great. And pain relief, oral rehydration solution, excellent. Low blood glucose, yeah, so you can see that from potentially VBGs. Very good um, suggestion from everybody. Um, in this particular patient, what would your top differentials be? So she's complaining of sort of generalized abdo pain. IBS, 
Okay. Pregnancy related, good. Gastroenteritis, excellent. Very good suggestions we've got here. So if you're thinking about this patient and, um, you know, so you're thinking she's got pain, so giving her some analgesia, antiemetics with the vomiting, uh, fluids for the lot, the losses. What do you think you'll be doing at the end, likely doing for this patient at the end? Would you be referring her or? Okay, we'll discuss that in a second. Outpatient follow-up. Okay, we've got a few suggestions here. So to just... So in this patient, it's likely that it is a gastroenteritis. Um, so say did a urine dip, baseline bloods, including VBG, say she isn't pregnant, um, or she could be pregnant, she could just have a gastroenteritis. So I know people said um, IV fluids, antibiotics. So um, these are all good suggestions. Um, the thing is, this, pa this patient is more likely able to go home um, just because you're treating her for some of the symptoms that she's having. Um, you can have uh, rehydration, all that pregnancy and UTIs, and you can get that from the urine dip. Um, if you are concerned for the patient or as your member that you can um, safe net this patient. So at any time that they're vomiting, you know, projectile vom vomiting throughout the day, next day, feeling really fatigued, unwell, you can always say come back um, and you've done your bit in terms of safety netting. So females aged 15 to 50 are pregnant until proven otherwise. So um, these are very good things to, to note. So always do a beta HCG, um, but you guys are on it and you mentioned it, so great. Um, so if we're talking about an OSCE situation, um, I'm, it's just one of those things you have to say A to E. I would give antiemetics, fluids, uh, depending on bloods, consider antibiotics, analgesia, but I don't need to really go on about that too much because you all, you all just did that already, so we can move on. So um, in young, stable patients, it's most likely gastroenteritis. Like I said, it's the more common thing. However, like you guys said, it's good to rule out pregnancy as well. Um, potentially a urine dip. If there's any electrolyte abnormalities, formal blood, you need to wait for all of them. So um, and safety net accordingly if bloods are fine and generally speaking patients so now here uh, sorry Okay, so I think someone's talking about um, the pseudonumoperitoneum sign abdominal x-ray. So I think this is better. I think there's actually going to be a radiographic um, episode talking about chest x-rays, abdominal x-ray. So, um, so that's for that question from Dr. Addy. Uh, that can be answered in the... Uh, So now we're looking at a male patient in his 50s, background of hypertension. So at the end of the and there's a pulsatile mass in his abdomen, and he's complaining of generalized abdo pain. His observations, he's hypertensive and he's tachycardic. So any idea is on basic. So, hold on a second. Urine dip, CT, abdomen, ABG. CT, abdomen, ultrasound, abdomen, ultrasound, sepsis six. Good. Very good. 
very impressed by these um, answers, everybody. So yeah, so investigations, um, everyone's saying urine dip, basic bloods, BBG. If you're thinking someone's tachycardic, hypertensive, potentially at this stage, you could be septic. But in the case of, um, a, I think the key here is as a pulsatile mass. So um, that's, that's a, yeah, we've got a good differential from some nice, yeah. So look at look for these key things. So management, what would you do for this patient? Fluids, good. Stenting, we've got from somebody. Pain relief, yeah. Okay, you guys are on it. It's very, very good. Refer to vascular surgeons. Yes. So, so, so everybody, just shout it out for me. What would be the top differential for this patient? Come on, guys. Shout. It. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, we're thinking of a ruptured triple A. Yeah. And I think you guys already mentioned it earlier, you'd give to the vascular team. Okay, so the next patient, you have females in her 20s. She doesn't have any obvious um, uh, background, but she's pale, she's cold, she's hypertensive, and she's tachycardic. What would you think of in this patient that to do uh, as your main investigations for her? So you do A to E, you do pregnancy test, FBCs. Yeah, good. So you do your VBGs, pregnancy test, urine dip. Great. Okay, so someone says check for appendicitis. Good, abdominal ultrasound. Yeah. So, what, so a few people said it out already. Yeah, she could be septic. So these things we do need to take into consideration. What would your top differentials be for this lady in her 20s? Yeah, you're right. So it could be an ectopic pregnancy. I think someone mentioned appendicitis. You're right, it could be that. Yeah. So what would you do with this patient? Would you send her home? No. <laughs> in caps. Good. So surgery, we're thinking of appendicitis. So if we're thinking of ectopic pregnancy, who would we refer to? Yeah, OBGYN, great guys. So like I said, we're not here to be professors and know exactly what's going on with this patient, especially at this stage when you're just getting basic investigations for this patient. So don't feel like you have to diagnose every single small thing about them. It's just the basic things, get them stable and send them to the right team. Just to practice safely is, is, the, is the main thing here and doing what's right for the patient. So next patient, you got a patient in their 70s, uh, previous history of diabetic disease. You're looking at them, they look quite sweaty, a little bit unwell. Generalized abdo pain is what he's complaining of. Looks a bit distended, hypertensive and tachycardic. So invest basic investigations, what would you do? Okay, so we've got abdo x-ray, PR, FBCs, someone mentioned a troponin. These are excellent suggestions. So I'm, I'm quite happy someone's mentioned a troponin at this stage. Someone in their 70s, they might come in with abdo pain, but always make sure you have an ECG troponin. You don't know if they've had an MI. So it's always good to, to do these things later on. Um, yeah, I'm just, sorry, I'm just having a look at what everyone's saying. Very good. Okay, so um, what would your management be for this patient? A to E, great. 
good painkillers yeah fluid ecg okay de oxygen depending on like if if they're saturating less than say like 94 percent you can consider that consider oxygen okay so what would your top what would your nil by mouth urinary catheter great so um what kind of differential would you think for this patient perforation history of diverticulitis mi perforation hypoglycemia so yeah, we're thinking of uh, potentially with the diverticular disease, you that per, per person's at risk of uh, perforation or obstruction. Could be intra-abdominal intra -abdominal sepsis, um, like they, they could have a collection there. So great suggestions from everybody. Um, okay, volvulus, yeah, it could be that. Yeah, it's part of obstruction. Great, okay. The next patient, so she this time she's complaining of right upper quadrant pain. So like I said, just think of, about it in a practical way. What, what organs are in this area? So you've got a female, she's in her 40s. She has an increased BMI. She looks okay. She feels okay. Our sounds are present. She's a little bit tachycardic. So what would you, okay. Um, what what are the basic sort of investigations you do in this patient? So just think from an A and E point of view, yeah. So you you can do TFTs if you need to, but it, it wouldn't potentially be your first thing you do. Yeah. Good ECG, full blood, urine, pregnancy test. Always do an VBG as well. Just see if she's acidotic. What's her lactate like? Amylase, great. Yep. ABGs. Okay, I guess if if she's if she's desaturating, you can consider an ABG. Yeah, excellent. So, how would you manage this patient? Basic management. Great, A to E, pain relief, yes. Probably not an NSAID in this, in this case. I don't know if this patient might have um, gastritis or anything like this. Always, if, if they're already complaining of abdo pain, just better to avoid NSAIDs. But fluids, okay, fine. In this kind of patient, what would your top differential be? Just give one or two. All stones, curly cystitis. Okay, fine. So I'm glad you guys have mentioned this. So, um, so this is what we consider biliary colic. So we'll talk about this patient in a cholangiocarcinoma. Oh, well, gone, well, we've, we've gone to the other end, but no, this is good. Um, pancreatitis, good. So I guess we can have a look at the amylase as well. Yeah. Good suggestions. So with this patient, we're thinking of biliary colic, more so because for the most part they're okay. They're complaining of right upper quadrant pain, but there's no there's no guarding their observations, apart from being a little bit tachycardic, might be associated with their pain. So you can see how you could do with conservative management first. If it's intermittent sort of pain, it's not bothering them to another level, then it's most likely you would be able to send this patient home. However, with this patient, it's always good to um, have a follow-up for her. So maybe in the, if that hospital has got a um, hepatobiliary uh, um, sort of section in the hospital, maybe you could refer her to that later on. Um, for suspected acute pancreatitis, is checking lipase better? Yeah, I think we don't typically do it in our hospitals here, but I know people do check for lipases as well but typically we tend to look at 
amylase and it tends to be three to six times more than the sort of average amount um, but we don't routinely do lipase for everyone now um, so ERCP so all these things are great I think for this patient probably needs an ultrasound I think that will be the best thing for her first and following that um, it's I think it's at the discretion of the team you refer it to and how she deals with her symptoms in the community um, so yeah I think one of those things that we look at in textbook 40s females increased BMI fair I think they don't always have to present in this way but these are sort of textbook cases okay so the next patient um, they're in their 60s they're pale they're cold you're at their bedside and seem to be coughing um, you look at their observations they're hypotensive they're tachycardic and they're pyrexic so what would the first things you do for this patient be? Okay, someone just shouted out septic. Great, love it. Well, I don't love sepsis, but I love these sepsis six, A to E, chest X ray, CRP, ECG, cardio markers. Amazing. I don't need to be teaching you guys this. You guys know it. Amazing. Yeah, so, so just, just always be careful. I know someone said oxygen. Just be careful with oxygen. If someone is desaturating less than 94%, they're not known to have any sort of COP, COPD or um, if they're retainers of carbon dioxide. So sometimes you've got to be careful. Some, sometimes giving someone oxygen can be more harmful to the patient than beneficial. So um, you do an ABG if you need to and just make sure you know, you're giving oxygen to the appropriate patient. Um, okay, so management. D-dimers, blood culture. Okay, good. Uh, D-dimers, good as well. Um, if, you, if we're querying potentially a PE, they're complaining of chest pain. Um, fluids, good. Anything else, anybody? Part of the sepsis six, what would you do? Fluids and antibiotics, great. Blood cultures. If you if you need to, you might need you might need to uh, put a catheter in for this gentleman or this lady. Three and three up, good. Okay, so top diagnosis: community acquired pneumonia, infective exacerbation of COPD. I'm assuming, yeah. So because they're coughing at the bedside, it's most likely this will help. So an X-ray will help with your diagnosis. So who would you refer this patient to? Would you send them home? No, <laughs> respiratory, good. So the, so the medics or the respiratory team, great. Okay, so now you have um, a male in his 30s. He's got foreign, he's had some recent um, foreign travel. So someone said, would you get raised temperature in PE? Not necessarily, but I think if someone is tachycardic, they're short of breath, they're complaining of chest pain, say if it was a sudden onset chest pain, uh, especially if someone, if they're elderly, don't really know what's going on with them, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to do a D-dimer and to see if they're at risk of having a PE. But if you do a chest X-ray and you do see co consolidation, it's unlikely that they have a PE. So, um, yeah. Okay, so you've got a male in his 30s, foreign travel, have a little feel of his tummy, it's quite tender in the right upper quadrant. You listen to his stomach, not, nothing really to write home about, um, but he's hypertensive, tachycardic and pyrexic. So what investigations would you be ordering in this patient? Hep C, serology, blood cultures, ECG, Uh, oh wow, LFTs, Deva screen, <coughs> TV screen, great guys. Okay, these are good. I think the, from a med, so if this patient's up on the ward, I guess you could, you know, you can do, you know, a viral hepatitis screen if you need to do all that. But from an A&E point of view, say you're putting those um, in, you, you know, you're, you're uh, got them in the pipeline, you've ordered those things. What's something you could get so much quicker? in this time? 
Imaging. So what imaging would, yeah, chest x-ray, good. So, yeah, so chest x-ray would be very good in this patient. So all the serology stuff you're talking about, this is good stuff, um, but it's unlikely you'll get all of those things from an A&E point of view immediately. But these are very good things that you have to have, especially take into consideration uh, foreign travel. Okay, so what would you do for management? Basic things for management. Good, A to E. So it's hypotensive, he's tachycard, great. Fluids, fluids, pain relief, antiemetics. Guess if he's not feeling too good. Okay, so for this patient, I know it could be a very, it could, could be a very exhaustive list of uh, differentials, but what would your top, top differentials be, guys? Hepatitis, malaria, gastritis, hep A, great guys. Yeah, so this is just one of the differentials we mentioned, but yeah, the very good suggestion from everybody. Okay, so now we're looking at the next patient, um, but it's related to the other patient that we spoke about earlier. 40s, female, increased BMI. However, her pain is now constant. She looks okay, but she's Murphy's positive. Related to what we said about before, Murphy's positive, we think of an acute cholecystitis. Um, deep breath in while palpating the right subcostal area. She's screaming in pain. She's now tachycardic. So these are some of the basic things you can do for her. Fast scan, I guess if she's really, really like, you know, rolling on the trolley in pain, um, you can get a senior to do a bedside scan, but after that, an ultrasound or a CT, erect chest x-ray if you need to, urine dip, is, is she pregnant? Um, so you do an ultrasound and you see some gallstones and swollen gallbladder. Um, thinking of potentially cholecystitis or col ascending cholangitis. So I think the difference here would be the ascending cholangitis we typically relate it to with Charcot's triad. So she might be jaundiced, she might be pyrexic, and she's complaining of right upper quadrant pain. So undoubtedly she will have to go to the surgical team. So the next patient, um, they're five, they've got central pain. Um, that's radiating to the right iliac fossa. Generally look well, but um, tachycardic and pyrexic. So what would you do in this patient? Just basic investigations. You're in the abdominal x-ray. Okay, so for this patient, yeah, it's true. You would, you would do basic bloods and urine dip if you need to. I would say, generally speaking, the pediatric, uh, um, in, in pediatrics, they typically tend to go for ultrasound just to prevent too much radiation for, for a child. Um, what would your top differential be? A little bit more common than kidney stones. Appendicitis. Appendicitis. Okay, so it's, I think it's the more popular answer is appendicitis. So yeah, I think in this case, um, the patient is uh, tachycardic and pyrexic. So appendicitis typically tends to be the more common common thing. Um, however, in about 70% of children under the age of 12, they do have non-specific abdo pain. Um, However, just with the tachycardia and, and the pyrexia, it's more likely to be appendicitis. So always refer that patient on. Okay, so next patient, 50s, male. He's a recent cough. Um, and he's got a groin swelling in his right iliac fossa um, and he's stable. So what basic stuff would you do for this patient? Someone's just gone straight for it, hernia. Hernia. Okay, <laughs> what would you do? What what basic investigations would you do? Ring occlusion test. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. And how would you manage this patient? Oh, geez, your surgical refer to surgeons. Okay, so um, refer to surgeons. So top diet, yeah, so someone's mentioned reducible, irreducible. This is what I was looking for. Okay, so if we're looking at swelling, I know someone said it early before, hernia, or a few of you said it. So I think what Andrew Jackson said, is it reducible, irreducible? Try to reduce it. If it's irreducible, and obviously there's still an ongoing swelling, this patient cannot go home. So we, you're right about the inguinal hernia, but it needs to be looked at a little bit more if um, it's irreducible. And he would go to the surgeons. Okay, so this is just um, a sort of a more unstable patient. So this time he's distended. He's got this groin swelling. He's tachycardic. So I know we mentioned earlier abdominal x-ray. Um, we potentially think is this an incarcerated hernia. So in this case, definitely a more unstable patient and would need to go to the surgeons. Okay, so the next patient. So left upper quadrant pain, background of sickle cell disease, looks okay, abdomen feels okay. Literally everything looks fine, but they have pain in the left upper quadrant. What would your investigations be for this pa patient? Ultrasound, okay. So yeah, we could do a formal ultrasound or if you're worried, you could do a fast scan in a and &E. um, FBCs, good. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, very good suggestions. How would you manage this patient? His obs are fine, he's just complaining of pain. So we just give some, um, yes, sickle cell crisis, splenic infarct, top differentials. Yeah, you guys are killing it, good. These, so these are some, like I said, it might not be the case and don't, don't worry. Sometimes, you know, you're not always right about these things, but no one's gonna, no one's gonna have a go at you because you're thinking, you know, this patient has a potential to be very, very unwell. And if, the, if someone thinks you're going to the other end, it's better to assume that some, you know, the worst thing's happening to someone as opposed to saying, no, he's okay, look, he's not guarding, he's obsifying, send him home. So yeah, so you would send this patient to surgeons, but if we're thinking, you know, if, yeah, early referral to hematology. So typically when you do refer to surgeons, you will, you will sometimes get an input from a hematology team just to make sure that the patient is well managed, you know, from a, um, a holistic point of view. But yeah, very good answers from everyone there. So next patient, in their 60s, increased BMI, and they're a smoker. They look unwell and they look pale. However, observations are fine. A bit of abdo pain in the left upper quadrant. Apart from that, they look okay. What would your investigations be, basic investigations be for this patient? Chest x-ray, good. Anything else? So he's in his 60s and he's a smoker and he's a big guy. ECG, great. Yeah, so we just need to rule out anything else that, you know, if, if there's any um, dynamic changes on an ECG. So think of troponin as well. A chest x-ray, if he's complaining, complaining of left upper quadrant pain, it could be the case of having a pneumonia, potentially. It could be um, a PE, we're not sure. So all these things need to be looked at. It's not just surgical stuff to look at. You have to keep, you have to cast a wide net, but not too wide. Just look at the main things that can get someone unwell. This is just an example. It could have been something else, but, um, oh, sorry. But yeah, it might need to refer to cardiology, um, potentially for an, for an MI. Uh, these are just examples. So um, just have a look at a variety of things. So now this patient left iliac fossa pain in their 60s, 
multiple comorbidities, looks okay, feels okay, bowel sounds present. So the observations, they can either be normal or they could be tachycardic, hypertensive and pyrexic. So what investigations would you do? Abdominal x-ray, urine dip, complete blood count. Erect chest x-ray, renal function test, great. Yeah, how would you manage this patient? So say he's ta tachycardic, hypertensive and pyrexic. What would you do for this man or woman? Management, fluids, yeah. Antibiotics. Good. Okay, so what are your top differentials? 60s, multiple comorbidities, AAA, diverticulitis, colitis. Any other things from anyone else? Diverticulitis. Great. Who would you refer this patient to? Bad obstruction. Say if they're unstable. Okay, good. Okay, so next pain, next patient, sorry. In their 50s, they're literally rolling around in pain. Like they're rolling on the trolley in pain, they're in that much pain. However, there's nothing really to write home about apart from the fact that they're a bit tachycardic. What investigations would you do for this patient? Kind of talked about it before. Okay, get an extra, the first thing you do, yes, urine dipstick, yes. So this will be, the first thing to go for a patient, but especially if um, you know, if male, female, it's always blood, ECG scan, urine, great. So it could be a case of if there's hematuria. So we're thinking of some sort of obstructive neuropathy, renal colic, yes, exactly. So yeah, you guys have already mentioned everything already. Um, how would you manage this patient? So he's in, he's in so much pain, what would you give him? Please don't say paracetamol. Okay, what pain relief? So if, if we're thinking potentially of renal colic, okay, IV morphine, oxycodone, morphine. Okay, so whilst these are very good suggestions, there's something that's like, it's like a magic thing for someone who's got renal colic. I, yes, diclofenac, diclofenac PR, great. So diclofenac PR, suppository, 100 milligrams. Literally someone who's rolling around on the bed in pain, some, suddenly they're walking around the department looking much better. So this will also help in your, um, you know, what, what happens to this patient and what kind of differential you have. So who would you refer this patient to? Urology, good. Okay, so next patient in their 40s, um, excess alcohol, they look generally unwell, epigastric pain with guarding, and they're tachycardic. What would you do in this patient for investigations? Yeah, okay, we'll start A to E, FBCs, VBG. I think you guys know this, I think it's because you're coming at a all coming at the same time, but yeah, good. How would you manage this patient? How would you, how would you manage this patient? Like what treatment would you give him? Okay, so if we're thinking of someone in their forties and you've got excess alcohol, you don't know when his last drink was. Okay, so someone like this, um, yes, is epoxide, so you don't want him to go into the jaw. Is there anything else you'd give to someone with a history? It's Pabronix. Good, everyone's mentioning it. Great. Okay, so what would your top differential be for this patient? Delirium, okay, Del delirium, delirium itself wouldn't be a diagnosis, um, but it could be part of something. 
pancreatitis, cirrhosis, peritonitis. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I like it. Pancreatitis. Yeah. So like I said, you don't need to, you don't need to be a professor and have like some really obscure diagnosis. Just look at the top, top few things, looking at this previous medical history, looking at what's presented, what's it most likely to be? Pancreatitis. But obviously you can have a few differentials. Okay, next patient, 50s, history of NSAID usage, they've got GERD, they look generally unwell, they're guarding, um, and their OBS just generally unwell and unstable. What would you do? Perforation, so we're thinking, okay, uh, what would you order? For bloods. Abdominal X-ray. Okay, we'll do a chest X-ray as well. We're gonna, if you want to see if there's any perforation. Okay, good. If you're, if you're getting blood and this patient with a history of NSAIDs and GERD, we'll do a group and save as well if we need to. Abdominal X-ray if we need to. CT scan following that. Troponin, ECG. Yeah, great. Gastroscopy. Yeah, you guys are on it. Who would you refer this patient to? She could have used aspirin to avoid MI. That's that's also true. So if so, if we're thinking that she's potentially at risk of perforation, it's unlikely she'd go to the medic straight away. She'd probably go to upper GI surgeons, and then once they've if she's stable, then you know likely that she'd go to the medics. Probably joint care. Okay, so next patient in their 50s, got pain in the suprapubic region, they're pale, they're sweaty, they're clammy, hypotensive, tachycardic and pyrexic. So come on guys, what would you do? What would you order for this patient? What investigations? Okay, so thinking of someone in the suprapubic area, what would you do? Someone's complaining of pain there, Okay, before, okay, so it's related to an ultrasound, I guess, but something you could do yourself or an HCA could do it. Bladder scan, good. So why are we thinking bladder scan? Bladder scanner. You wanna just make sure they're not in urinary retention. Good. Um, so obstruction, bladder stone. Okay, so those kind of things you probably wouldn't get from a, from a, a bladder scanner itself. You just wanna know how much they're retaining. Do you need to catheterize them? Um, and also for input output chart, it's, it's just good to measure exactly what's going in, what's coming out. Okay, so how would you manage this patient? Someone said sepsis six, so how would you treat that? So fluids and antibiotics and input output chart capital if you need it, cultures, good. Okay, so what would your top diagnosis be for this top differential diagnosis be? UTI. Okay, yeah. To be so urosepsis, yeah. So yeah, good. Good. You send this patient home with some antibiotics? No, good. Good to know that no one will send them home. Okay, so now next patient, 70s, male, Afro-Caribbean. Um, they've got a palpable mass, but otherwise they're okay. Um, what would your investigations be for this patient? Bone marrow biopsy, wow. In A&E, wow. <laughs> a little bit less extreme. PSA, DR, great. I love it. PR, I feel like the PR is very, very, very underrated in general. So we're doing, so I, I like the fact that someone said a PR and a urine dip. And yeah, a bladder scan if you need to, an ultrasound scan, CT scan is a great stuff. Um, from a PR, what we're looking at, what are we looking for when we do a PR? BPH, okay. Enlarged prostate, yeah. So if, if we're thinking 
potential malignancy as well. So if it's a, if, if it's not a smooth sort of enlarged prostate that would re would relate to a benign prostate hyperplasia, or if it's a craggy yeah prostate CA. So these kind of things, like I said, you're not meant to be a, you don't have to be a professor, but it's just good to know um, uh, you know what what the size of the prostate is, or if it's enlarged, and just generally the borders, you know. Okay, so you might need to, yeah, I think you guys mentioned PSA, bladder scan, urine dip, catheter if we need to, acute retention, BPH, PSA, yeah, good stuff. Okay, now we've got a patient with central abdominal pain, they're in their 60s, they've had previous abdo surgery, they're distended and they look generally unwell. Um, you can't hear any bowel sounds. They're hypotensive and they're tachycardic. Ultrasound. Okay, so you do a fast scan for this patient. Yeah? Small bowel obstruction, secondary to adhesions, fast scan. Good. So um, just to... Good. Okay, how would you manage this patient? So far, okay, so far scan, this is just um, a scan that you do by the bedside and you, they, use it in, they use it in trauma patients as well, but anyone with acute abdomen, just to make sure that there's nothing too crazy on there before you send them to CT. This is just something that you do bedside in a &E. Refer to surgery. Okay, so what would your top differentials be for central abdo pain? Okay, think of, yeah, it could be bowel obstruction, but previous, okay, good. And who would you send this patient to? Surgeons. But yeah, thinking bowel obstruction, I think someone mentioned Riles tube. Yeah, you guys did really well. Pancreas, yeah, no, these are very good differentials. This is just an example of the top differentials, but you guys are on a roll with the differentials you're, you've got. Okay, so um, so I know we've just worked through quite a few um, of the um, cases. We've been able to define a few abdomen, recognize some of the patterns of abdominal pain, um, understanding when a patient is sick, unwell, deteriorating, some reasonable differentials, and basically the basic stuff to investigate uh, for them, and then a, a reasonable management plan. It'd be great if you could just um, scan the QR code or use the hyperlink below for feedback form, and you can also get these certificates. Um, you can take this moment just to ask any questions if you need to. Say hello again. Any questions, anybody? Please conduct such webinars. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah, Natalie um, is in charge of that, and there will be many more episodes coming out. If you'd like to watch this again um, at, your, at your leisure, Natalie will be putting them up on YouTube, so you can follow us there as well. Um, there's also um, Facebook, and I think there's Instagram, I think they're on Twitter as well. Um, yeah, there, there's there's a lot of places to get into get interactive with us. Um, any suggestions or any questions about the PowerPoint, you can ask now if you need to. Otherwise, we'll call it call it a day. So I'll just to give you guys a second. Just any more questions? In any in a &E, have you dealt with many cardiovascular injuries or trauma? Yes. Oh my God. Yes. There's a lot. I think that's a thing. That's a good thing with a &E. I would always suggest to anybody, um, if you don't ever have an a &E placement, try to do some a &E locums if you need to, because I was such per I was such a person. I didn't have the opportunity to have an a &E rotation. I did it as a locum, and you look at pediatrics. You look at Jer Jerry's patients. You look at someone who's got leukemia and got neutropenic sepsis. You've got your trauma patients, you literally get everyone coming in. So I would highly recommend that to, for someone to do a &E. 
if you need to. An acute abdomen comes up all the time. Would you recommend a taster week? Yes, go ahead. Taster week is great. If not, just put yourself down for banxious, for any. They always need doctors, even if it means once a week or once every fortnight. You can just get those ATLS skills and ALS skills and put them in to action. It's not just something you do in an exam. Is there any way of getting your email? Uh, I think Natalie has the email. Sorry, I don't know what the email is. Um, but yeah, there, there is an email address that Natalie will provide. Which hospital did you mention? Which hospital have I worked at? I worked at quite a few hospitals. I predominantly work in Essex and also at the Whittington in North London. But they're all great. I think A and E is A and E. So whatever it is, you guys should definitely, definitely do an A and E rotation or a locum shift. I'm not from India, I'm from Sri Lanka. <laughs> Okay, fine. Anything else to do with the presentation? No. Okay, well, thank you guys.